Okay. We will resume now. And uh, as far as I know, up to now, there is no change uh, to this morning program. So what you have in your quick reference card is correct. I mean, first day, we don't have any change. And it's the last day of the meeting also. Before we start the first talk, two announcements. First one, first announcement has to do with the survey, the Swissport survey. We want to give a big thank you to all of those among you, more than hundreds, which have taken the time to be interviewed for that survey. And uh, there are still some of you which have still the survey papers which I have to complete. I mean, please do not forget to give them either at the reception desk here or to any annotator with a red dot. It doesn't need to be the one who interviewed you, but please do not leave with this uh, uh, survey. It would be stupid not to give it back. And what we will do with the survey, we will, of course, process the results, try to summarize it in a nice way and make it available to all of you, but also to the rest of the community. When exactly, I don't want to give a date because uh, this summer is very busy. Somewhere in the autumn we will do this. So that's the first announcement. Second announcement series about the hotel. Everybody changing rooms at the Oasis Hotel should check out and check in to get a new key card. You can do that when we come back. So don't need to rush out and go to a taxi. You do this when we come back just after the end of the meeting. And if you're staying on at the Oasis Hotel for any reason, vacation, ISMB, and so on, please check with the hotel reception at one point, once people have gone and so it's not a big queue at the reception, so that they have the correct checkout date for you. Because in a few cases, they didn't have the correct checkout date. So please do this. Okay, so let's start with the scientific program. And I'm happy to welcome, as the first speaker of today, Alex Batman. Alex is at the Wellcome Trust at the Sanger Institute in Inkston, so part of the Wellcome uh, complex of institutes. And I would say he has always been interested since he started working in this field with Sir Shatya in domain organization of protein. And that led him to co-found with other people, which I will mention later, the PFAM database, and across the years, he has been more and more involved in it. He's, of course, heading it, I mean, uh, for already a number of years. I don't know since then, but I mean, nine years. So, and But he did, he's not only involved with PFAM. He has also developed a database of RNA motif called RFAM. And he has become recently also the principal investigator for MERAPS, which is a wonderful database of uh, protease and protease inhibitors, which was created by Alan Rallett and Neil Rawlings. And Neil Rawlings still works on this with uh, uh, Alex. And also is responsible for the NAR database special issues, the editor of that issue, and is an executive editor of bioinformatics. As geographical links, I put Newcastle, Cambridge, MRC, and Inkston. As biolinks, I put Cirrus, with whom he worked. Sean Eddy, Richard Durbin, with whom he has been involved since the beginning of PFAM, Ewan Burney, of course, Corinne Yates, Neil Rawlings, and I would say everyone in the Interpro Consortium. Now, let's leave two, well, two minutes, the introduction of Alan, oh, sorry, of Alex, for one thing. And that's maybe the privilege of the organizer to do a small, I mean, mini presentation of one minute, and you will see it's relevant. I mean, I think that it's important to say that competition can be healthy when it's done in a respectful atmosphere and when the user be community benefits from this competition. And I think it's important to recognize that Interpro is the best example of such healthy competition. You have a number of groups, each working independently, doing their domain and family database, yet integrating all their efforts so that the users does not, I mean, basically have to see all of the different things that goes behind and have only a unified, I mean, set of discriminators. PFAM and ProSite have always had complementary aims. PFAM is more exploratory for annotating genomes, 
In ProSight, we tend to use ProSight for own annotation of proteins, so we're going to more details and specific residue annotation. And, I mean, it's fair to say that Cisco annotators at Geneva, at EBI, or in Brazil, always make use of PFAM, any protein with domain. If the domain is not covered by a ProSight descriptor, we use a PFAM, and we have a domain list where we have many, many of those domains coming from PFAM. So we're grateful for all the wonderful work that PFAM Group carried over the years. But also what I want to do now is ask Nikki Mulder to come to the podium. She's, are you here, Nikki? Please come in. We owe you, all of us, a big thank you. <laughs> and I wanted to do this small ceremony with Terry Atwood, which to so that the three first database will be represented here, the one which was at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, unfortunately, as you know, she was uh, what we call very good, <laughs> so she couldn't come. So on behalf of the three databases, here's a small and thank you for all that you <laughs> So, let's resume now. And the last thing about Alex, so that he can start on his talk, is that domains are important not only in proteins, but also in other aspects of the world, and one of his hobbies is origami, and you can visit his origami page. So, Alex, I'll let you. Okay, well, Thank you uh, very much, Amos, for that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank the organizers. Okay, is that working now? Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Amos, and I'd particularly like to thank the organizers for giving me the uh, opportunity to hug Nikki Mulder. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Uh, Classification is really at the heart of science. It allows us to organize our knowledge, uh, make hypotheses and predictions um, about our data, and that's really essential. So PFAM is a, a classification of protein families, and PFAM's goal is to try and correctly and completely annotate and classify all the protein families and domains in nature. So it's a large international collaboration, um, and the top line of names here are the people who are currently working on PFAM, and below are the long list of people who over the years have helped in, in one way or another. Okay, so what I want to do first is just to get a sense of uh, how many of you have used PFAM. So I'm going to ask for a call of hand, so hands up if you've used PFAM. Okay, well that's uh, very comforting, but there are still plenty of people there who, uh, who didn't put their hand up, who haven't used PFAM, and uh, I'm going to try and persuade you that you should, and uh, also I'll, I'll give you an introduction to PFAM, so that those people who've never heard of it, really don't know what I'm talking about, have some idea. Uh, that's for you, Lawrence, somewhere out there. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so PFAM is a collection of protein families and domains, and here is shown a, a whole bunch of uh, some of my favorite proteins, and each of the boxes and bubbles represents a protein domain. Protein domains are the common currency of protein function and protein structure. So in PFAM, for each of these domains, there'll be a separate entry for each one of them. And this is what you'll see there. This is the entry for the protein kinase domain, and uh, you'll see there's protein structure there. On the right-hand side, we have annotation, kindly provided by uh, the Interpro Consortium, as well as Go annotation also from Interpro. And if you scroll down this page, you can get all sorts of information, multiple sequence alignments, phylogenetic trees, uh, graphical views of what all the domains are in the protein, and, and so forth. So, you know, I'd really recommend that you do go, go ahead and use PFAM. Now, yesterday... Uh, 
couple of days ago, Janet uh, gave a presentation about EBI, and she talked about the deluge of data. And she presented the EBI as this ship in rough, stormy seas. It's not quite how I see the deluge of data. This is more how I think of it. And uh, here we see the PFAM team uh, being swamped by this deluge of data. So from the very beginning, 10 years ago, PFAM was designed specifically to deal with this deluge of data. This hasn't just happened now. It's been growing and growing and growing. And so I'll show you in the next few slides how we deal with this. And essentially what we have is a semi-automatic approach to uh, finding the domains in proteins. So for each of the 8,000 families in PFAM, we have a seed alignment which contains representative sequences in the family. And here's a a picture of a, a fairly typical seed alignment. And from that seed alignment, we build a profile hidden Markov model with the hammer package. Um, So hidden Markov models, they sound complicated. They probably are. So this is what David Littman said about uh, hidden Markov models. This is the head of NCBI. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. So we've got 8,000 of these hidden Markov models. We've got to search them against our favorite uh, protein database, Uniprot, of course. And to do that, we have to take account, we have to use the PFAM supercomputer because nothing else is just going to be able to do all these searches for us. And so here we have the PFAM team uh, analyzing the results. Looks like they've just found another IG domain. They're pretty excited about it. Okay, so once you've searched Uniprop with a PFAM supercomputer, we look at the output of these searches and we choose a threshold and we choose the threshold separately for each family. And then we make a a full alignment of everything that's above the threshold. Now, these alignments, what we try to do is make sure that there are no false positives in any of the alignments. So we try to get as much as possible, but we will not tolerate any false positives that we know about. Okay, so within PFAM, we're completely obsessed by a measure of coverage, and this tells us how well we're doing. Because at the beginning of the talk, I said we want to completely and accurately classify all protein sequences. And this shows how many protein, uh, what fraction of Uniprot that we're covering with PFAM. So on the y-axis, we have the coverage in percent. This is the fraction of sequences that have at least one PFAM domain within them. And you can see we're at about 75% now, and uh, hopefully we'll get to 100%, and that will be when we have a complete uh, classification. So you can do some crummy crummy curve fitting in Excel and uh, come up with this. And this says that when we have 24,322 families, we will have finished PFAM. And uh, I've done a bit more modeling, and depending on how you count things and uh, the, the, the number of sequences, uh, number of families that we're building each month and each year in PFAM, I can estimate that I'll retire somewhere between September 2012 and May 2033. So uh, I'm getting the golf clubs ready now. Okay, so that's really a, a, a whirlwind tour through PFAM, and hopefully it gives some of you some idea of, of what it does. And I'd really encourage you to go and have a look around and see if it might be useful to you. So next I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, areas of PFAM that maybe even those people who have used PFAM may not have uh, seen or or heard of yet. And the first of those is uh, a sub part of PFAM called IPFAM for interacting PFAM. So in the past, uh, PFAM has considered proteins completely in isolation. Okay, we just care about what domains are on those proteins. But recent studies have shown that pretty much the large large majority of proteins in the cell are parts of a a large complex. Okay, they're interacting with each other to carry out their cellular function. And so we wanted to bring some of this information into PFAM. So you've seen plenty of slides like this through through the conference. And these are very useful. They tell you which proteins are interacting with each other. So for example, UPF1 in the middle there is interacting with UPF2. But to my mind, that's not really good enough. That's not what we really want to know. 
Coming from PFAM, what I want to know is I want to know which domain in UPF1 is interacting with which domain in UPF2. That's what I really want to know. Actually, that's not good enough. What I really want to know is I want to know which residues in UPF1 are interacting with which residues in UPF2. That's what I really want to know. But there's only one source of getting this kind of uh, exact data, and that's from the Protein Structure Data Bank. So this is what we've done in IPFAM. We've taken protein structures, we found where the PFAM domains lie in those structures, and then we've looked to see where they interact with each other. So the kind of things that you can see in IPFAM are shown here. So this is a single protein with three domains. And so you can see that the yellow domain interacts with the green domain and the red domain. But the green domain doesn't interact with the red domain. And if we want to see these interactions in more detail, then you can. You can go and look directly at the structure as shown on the left. Or on the right-hand side, if you click there, you can find out exactly which residues are interacting with each other. And so you could find out perhaps uh, you know, if these uh, SNPs are involved in a protein-protein interaction site. So some of the things in IPFAM are, are, are complex, and so I'd say this was a complex complex. And if you wanted to understand what, what domains and protein chains were interacting in this molecule, um, frankly, you'd have to get the, uh, uh, a viewer open, get a highlighter pen, and draw lots of sort of circles and squiggles. But actually, IPFAM makes this much simpler. So here we have uh, this complex. Uh, yes, I know it looks complicated, but it's not as complicated as doing it by hand. I know I've done it. And so all of this has been published uh, last year in Bioinformatics, if you, if you want to find out more. OK, so moving on, the last thing that I want to talk about are PFAM clans. So in the past, what PFAM has done is taken Uniprot and searched its hidden Markov models with the PFAM supercomputer and made a whole bunch of PFAM families, 8,500 currently. And we ensure that none of these families overlaps with each other. Not even one single residue in Uniprot can belong to more than one PFAM family. And this is an incredibly strong quality control for us because if we build a new family and we find an overlap to an existing family, then that tells us that either there's a false positive in one of the families, which we can correct, or possibly that they're related to each other. Now, in the past, when we found they're related to each other, what we've had to do to stop there being an overlap is raise one of the thresholds. And so that's cost us in terms of our coverage. So what we've done is we've introduced PFAM clans, and these are where we group together families which we know are related into these clans. And in a clan, families can, we can lower the thresholds and allow them to overlap. And that will give us uh, an increase in coverage, which is what we want to do because I need to go and play golf. So uh, here's an example of one of these uh, PFAM clans. This is the immunoglobulin superfamily that I spent three years working on during my PhD. And so each of the blue boxes here represents one of the PFAM families. The lines between them represent uh, matches found by the PRC software. This is a, a a profile comparer that takes two hidden Markov models, compares them to each other, and will say if there's a relationship. And so you can find these on the clan pages in PFAM, and you can click on those links between them, and you'll, get, you'll be able to see an alignment of the two hidden Markov models. So clans do increase coverage, and here's, here are five example clans in the table. So the EGF, QP, and alpha beta hydrolases, Rossmann's, and ion channels. And in the middle column, we have the number of domains before they were put into clans. So for the EGFs, the, I think five families contained about just under 7,000 different domain, domains in Uniprot. So when we put these into a clan and we can lower the, the, the thresholds and allow them to overlap, then we get an increasing uh, coverage of 15%. So this is really you know, significant gains here for these families. So where do clans come from? Well, these are pretty much equivalent to uh, things that have been described in SCOP and CAP, the, the superfamilies. And so we use uh, SCOP uh, to identify these things. 
But we also use the literature. Lots of people have written lots of papers which unify a whole bunch of families together. So we also use this profile comparer software as well. That's been excellent and really, really useful in, in building these clans. And also, as I mentioned, overlaps. If we find overlaps between existing families, then that tells us that, that they uh, are related or that we have some false positives to get rid of. So now the last thing on this list I've said is almost overlap. So what do I mean by that? This is where if you have the search output from two of your hidden Markov models, then sometimes it, it happens that there are some matches, they're just at the top of the noise, and they, they cross-react between the families. And to, to some, an expert in sequence analysis, they'd say, ah, perhaps these families are related. And so I kind of wanted to incorporate this information into an algorithm that would automatically go and look for these sorts of things. And so um, I came up with something called SCOOP, which stands for Simple Comparison of Output Program. And this is uh, literally just a few lines of Perl, uh, unlike the several thousand lines of code that other software for doing these kind of things takes. So here we have uh, two hidden Markov models. There's the white hidden Markov model and uh, David Littman's red hidden Markov model on, on the right. So shown below them are, are the, the search outputs from searching against Uniprot. And what we're interested in is, are there any matches in these two output files that are in common? And so we just look through them, compare them all to each other, and say, are, are they in the same region of any protein? But Uniprot's huge now, and so you can take any two families and compare them together, and you'll find some just by random chance in, in the noise that overlap. So the big question is, do you see more of them uh, in shared between the two output files than you expect by chance? And so this is what the scoop method tries to do. So in this particular example, there was one uh, sequence that's in common, and, and so Scoop will then say, well, how many would I expect by chance, and then give you a score. Now, what's really notable here is uh, in the, the white output line, we have the uniprot uh, accession.version, and then we have the description line, we have a score, and then we have an e-value. And you'll notice that the e-value is 4.6. Well, if, if you could read it, you'd notice that. So what Scoop is doing is it's not just looking at all the things which are significant matches. If they were significant matches, then we'd have spotted them already. So it's really looking at these insignificant matches as well. Okay. Now, are we justified in doing this? Well, we think so. So Bill sort of covered this in, in his talk a little bit. And so whenever you do a, a database uh, search, you get a distribution of matches. And the large fraction of those are just false matches. They're noise. And overlapping that, you get the real matches, and you, you pick some threshold, some significant e-value, which gets the things in red here, which you're confident about, but there's a whole bunch of real things which are, are in the noise, which have insignificant e-values. And so what we hope is that if two families are related, that these real things that are in the noise will uh, allow us to detect the similarity. So how does the, the method do? So this graph uh, is a, a rock curve. It shows on the y-axis the number of true relationships between families against the number of false relationships between families for a given scoop score. And um, this search is carried out against PFAM clans. Now, this was carried out on an old set of PFAM clans before I started using scoop to find the relationships. So there's no circularity there. And what I've done is I've compared scoop against the PRC software, which is uh, a good state-of-the-art tool for, for finding relationships between families. And you won't be able to see this very clearly, but at the bottom is a, a blue line, and that is, uh, that's a scoop score, but it's a raw score. And we're then going to normalize that, and then that becomes the red line, which is somewhat higher than the PRC line, which is in black. So uh, the best method would uh, go up to the left-hand, top left corner, and across to the right. So you want to push the the curve up and up and up. So the method works, uh, uh, despite being s supremely naive. Uh, it's just amazing. I, I, I was extremely surprised by this. OK, so this allows us to find lots of interesting novel relationships. And I just list a, whole, a, a few of them here. And at the bottom, uh, one that I've picked out uh, to show you as an example is Duff283. 
Uh, so DUFs are domains of unknown function in PFAM. And this is related to the double-stranded RNA binding domain. And well, you know, who cares? It's another double-stranded RNA binding domain, but it's the proteins that DUF283 is found in that makes it interesting. So DUF283 is found in this protein here. And this protein is called DICER. So DICE is the, the enzyme that's in, involved in cleaving uh, messenger RNA in uh, the RNAi process, and also in processing um, microRNAs. And so the, this has been a very well-studied protein. Uh, in fact, um, Lorenzo Ceruti, Nina Mian, and myself published a paper on it back in 2000, describing some of the domains. And people have been looking at this continuously over the years. And so what we've done is shown that this uh, domain of unknown function in DICER is actually probably related to the double-stranded RNA binding domain. So it turns out that all along there was this other site of double-stranded RNA binding in DICER that no one had noticed. And so at the bottom of this slide I show a, a couple of structures that have been done of domains uh, in the RNAi process and currently DUF283 is uh, undergoing um, hopefully structure solution in Cambridge. Okay, so uh, next I just want to, before I wrap things up, I wanted to say um, a huge thank you to all the uh, annotators involved in the, the Uniprot knowledge base. Um, and also, not to forget all the programmers there too who do a sterling job and help the, the curators to do the best that they can. And so this is how I think of all you people, and I'd like to say thank you very much to Amelson Rolf's Weapons of Mass Curation. And there they are. Okay, so just to quickly go over what I've said before. No, no, we're not. <laughs> There's more. I still have five minutes. Okay, so PFAM was designed with this in mind to help deal with the data deluge, and so we think we're well-placed to keep up with the global ocean surveys and, and whatever else you can throw at us. So, Secondly, I've told you about IPFAM, which is, allows us to, to take PFAM to another level and start to understand something about how, how these domains are interacting with each other. And finally, PFAM clans are this uh, way that we can start to increase the coverage of PFAM and say what families are related to each other. And, and the bonus of this is that it, it increases our coverage. And as my final point, and this is my final slide now, um, I'd really like to thank, of course, Rolf and Amos for giving me the opportunity to, to come and play in, in their protein world. So thank you uh, both very much, and, and thank you for your attention. So do we have any questions? I was curious, between when you retire, how many families do you think you'll have? Do you have any way of knowing? 24,332. Yeah. And well, clans? Sorry? And clans? That's a good question. So we don't know that. Um, so Cyrus Chofia many years ago estimated that the majority of sequences would fall into no more than 1,000 superfamilies. And, and in fact, that's more or less why we, that motivated us to start PFAM, because the problem was finite and we only needed to build 1,000 of them. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't really read the small print, and that was the majority of proteins. It turns out that there's a very long tail of superfamilies, which um, we have to do. So uh, I'm hopeful. I think 2012 is uh, very, very optimistic. Good luck. Thank you once again. Thanks.